Okay, Mark, thank you so much for being here. I always ask our guest to introduce themselves because I think it always comes across best that way. So can you just introduce yourself a bit about what you do uh, in your role as an MP for the Canadian people? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, so I'm Mark Holland. I'm member of parliament for the riding of Ajax and uh, am also uh, our party's chief government whip, uh, which I've been doing for about the last two and a half years. Okay, what does that mean for all of us? <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a, I get that question a lot. So whips a lot of things. I'd say that my number one job, Mike, is just to bring people together. So uh, I have the job of trying to get our cabinet and our caucus all on the same page in legislation. So you can imagine uh, people have a lot of opinions, but most importantly, they have a lot of opinions that they're representing from different parts of the country. Right. Um, and trying to get that all on the same page to be able to find a way to, uh, to to get legislation adopted. It was a lot easier in a majority government context because I only had to worry about my own caucus. Uh, but now, of course, I've got to work with uh, the other caucuses, uh, namely the NDP, the Bloc, and the Conservatives, and to some extent the Greens, to try to build support for whatever our legislative agenda is. So first and foremost, I'm responsible for, uh, for making sure the legislation we put on the table gets adopted. Um, so I spent a lot of time bringing people together on that basis. Uh, the next thing is I kind of act as the coach for the team, uh, both in the sense that we're responsible for human resources uh, for all MPs, uh, but also supporting them in, uh, in their work as parliamentarians. Uh, so that, that is logistic as things as simple as making sure uh, that we are that we choose what offices they're in, we choose what committees they're on, um, we uh, help them navigate um, uh, various problems they have, uh, but also try to support them in their role of being a parliamentarian. Uh, we do play the role of disciplinarian uh, in the WIPS office. We try to do that very infrequently. Somebody has to really step outside the lines to use discipline. Again, we try to do it through, um, through, through finding common ground more than anything else. Um, and outside of that, we're responsible for making sure uh, that committees in the House, um, people are where they are supposed to be, uh, that they leave when they're supposed to leave. They arrive when they're supposed to arrive. Uh, so we, we handle a lot of the logistics, uh, what time the, the trains leave and what time they come in. Cool. Great. That's that's helpful to know. And I, I think that skill set is desperately needed right now in our very, seems to be many different viewpoints are at, at odds with each other right now in particular. Um, do you, can you, do, I'm always fascinated about how people get into the things they do. It, can you just give a bit of background on kind of how you became uh, who you are today and what led you into wanting to be, you know, part of public life? Well, I, it was always in me. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I go back to being six in a sandbox. I was fascinated by politics. <laughs> um, I think it came from my grandfather to a large extent. He was very civically minded. Uh, he would tell me that, uh, you know, if you wanted to change things, you had to learn how to get civically involved and learn how to deal with uh, politicians. He didn't necessarily have a lot of love for politicians, but he had a lot of love for civics. And uh, so that always stuck with me. And uh, when I was 12, I decided to get involved in my first political campaign. Uh, my mom dropped me off with uh, with a lunch and, uh, and I, a really wonderful person. Her name was Nora Stoner, who was just uh, really, really kind to me. Um, you know, I, I went in there and I was 12 years old I and mean, it was basically babysitting. Um, and they found, uh, you know, jobs for me to do and uh, ways for me to feel like I was making a contribution. And I loved it. Um, and so I just continually uh, got involved. I ran the first time when I was uh, when I was 19. I lost. I was devastated. Um, uh, I was uh, convinced I would never do it again. Uh, but I got involved. I managed a few different campaigns. I got elected to municipal council. Uh, uh, when I was uh, 22, um, and then uh, spent a lot of years there, and then ended up uh, there was a new seat created federally uh, when I was 29, and I uh, was fortunate enough to be elected in my home area when there was a new riding uh, there. So, uh, you know, I, I, other than losing in 2011, I had a four and a half year hiatus out of politics where I was lucky to work at Heart and Stroke, and I did a bunch of different things for them. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, was there, um, ended up being the, uh, the, the, the head of mission for Ontario uh, and their national um, director for children and youth programs. So I really enjoyed that. But really, this has been my life's passion. It's been what I've been doing since I was, uh, uh, it, it, except for that four and a half year period, it's what I've been doing since I was uh, 22. Wow, that's amazing. Um, did you study politics in school or you, like how, 
yeah what did you do there yeah yeah i studied uh, i took political science um and history uh in uh, university of toronto and uh, and spent uh, every waking minute outside of that um, uh, in politics. So if I wasn't studying politics, I was in politics. And I had a child when I was incredibly young. Uh, you know, our first son was born when uh, when I was 21 years old. So uh, managing a, a very young family uh, at 21 and uh, in the midst of all of that at the same time. So it was a it was a chaotic period. But I, I yeah, I mean, I was uh, immersed myself in it uh, in every way that I could. I was I mean, it was my passion. It is my passion. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think I, in the context of, I guess, human beings, psychology, the way we think, I think a lot of people now are a bit not disheartened, but perhaps are losing or are in a place where they're not feeling empowered to have control over decisions being made around them. So if we take COVID, as a specific example, that's a bit extreme. Do you think, how do you see our individual kind of civilian desire for things to happen in society? Uh, where's the connection between those things and what actually happens in Ottawa or you know at Queen's Park or in any kind of decision-making apparatus? And how might or, or what have you personally even as a voter because you're a voter and and how do you how do you think about reconciling that tension and maybe examples you've seen of people doing maybe a great job and maybe where they could do better sure so i mean i think in life um you know you you're really confronted with one of two choices um you know, when we wake up in the morning, there are things that we don't like in the world. Um, there are things that we think are unjust or unfair. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we try to do something about it or we uh, decide we can't do anything about it. And I think uh, that is a very, uh, very difficult uh, conflict that exists inside of ourselves because there are some things we simply cannot control. Uh, you know, there are and COVID is, is a great example of that, as you, as you call it, an extreme example where we have to accept a circumstance over which we have no control. Uh, you know, did I ever imagine there would be a circumstance where it would be, uh, you know, I would be uh, in making news because I, I, I uh, you know, Steph and I went on a trip somewhere, right? Like, you know, or if uh, the fact that I can't hug my mother, uh, you know, that we got to, uh, can't go to a restaurant. You can't do these super basic things. Um, and uh, so we're in this incredibly restricted world. And we have to let go of those things. Uh, we have to accept that we can't control what we, what, we, what we can't control. But for all of us, there are those things that we can control. And so the things that seem incredibly unjust or unfair, um, being able to look at like, how can I make a material difference to those things? And I always have been somebody driven by, you know, getting upset or getting, uh, particularly by injustices, seeing things that I don't think make sense, think, seeing things I don't think are fair and wanting to get involved and wanting to do something about it. And, you know, so when I talk to my youngest son, as an example, he can get very, very upset about, you know, different things that are coming, going on. And I said, okay, well, let's break it down to the things that you yourself can control. What are things that you in the time that you have can take some action on and make a difference to make yourself feel like you're helping the world move positively towards a better outcome. And I think that's all any of us can do. And that's all any of us can do uh, not only as individual citizens, but but as an elected official, if you try to take on all of the things that are wrong in the world, you're just going to get overwhelmed and implode. Um, you have to let go of a lot of things and accept that you know those aren't your things to worry about, and then focus on what can I, as an individual, realistically change. And if I want to look back in a rocking chair over my time as a civic citizen, forget you know whatever job I had. You know, what did I do to try to make the world around me better with the limited power that I have to do it? And, you know, realistically, um, uh, you know, I as an elected official have a little bit more um, leverage to change things, but only ever so much. And this is what I learned in my time in Heart and Stroke, too, is that you only ever have so much power as, as there are people ready to, for that change. So, you know, politics is about, um, is, is about leading to some degree, but it's but it really, you can't do that unless the population is ready to move with you, which is one of the reasons why advocacy, uh, you know, the work of not-for-profits, the work of, you know, people like yourself who are trying to create the climate 
for people to accept the change and be ready for it. Um, it's only when the population is ready to go there, and, you know, with Churchill called the art of the possible, um, that, that, that we can do those things. And so, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a change needs to be made and no, nothing more frustrating than see it not be made until you understand the reason it's not being made is because the population's not ready for it. And if we do something the population's not ready for, the next government's gonna go throw it in the trash bin and all of it's gonna go to waste. And I've seen too many things where I was really excited to change something, but we were moving ahead of where the population was. And then uh, you see that it gets thrown in the trash bin by subsequent government and all that work is for naught. So you have to build a strong foundation for it. Yeah, that is such a good example. For people, I mean, the, the idea of you can only, hey, you only have influence over the things you can control. It is so simple and also sometimes excruciatingly annoying. And yeah, it's a wonderful example because people in, there's a, there's a saying, it's a prayer, I guess, but it's been, uh, what would you say, uh, atheists atheist that did or whatever i don't know if there's a word for that non-dogmatic that says you know god the universe whatever grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference and yeah it certainly can be a really soothing thing to remember and and also i think a lot of people are not taught how to deal with the things they can't control which leads into I think a lot of the resentment towards authority or public people or just decision makers in general because people get dis disillusioned. And, and one thing you said that was really helpful for me to hear is making sort of trying to make decisions congruently with where the majority of people are in some ways. And, and that sparked a thought or a question, how I'm going to try to word this as best I can. Um, I think it's fair to say our mainstream media outlets and our, our trusted source of information as a society, those things are getting, I think, disrupted, of course, by tech and social media and et cetera. And so as those business models are deteriorating or becoming more difficult to generate profit, then the incentive seems to be to make it more sensationalized or make it more divisive. So there's more clicks and there's more this and that. Um, how, so I guess the question is where, where, how do we reconcile that in some sense? Like there seems to be a, a, a lack of integrity almost in the way the news is reported. Um, I, I don't know, those, that's kind of the frame that these a lot of people see these issues in but yet I, i'm not connected to too much of the political discourse but certainly in the mainstream media there's no acknowledgement of any of this kind of stuff you know and it's really frustrating for all the people that are consuming information through alternate sources one example was some this is in the us but there was somebody on cnn the other day who basically said you know, we need to shut down all these news sources on YouTube because they're telling a different story than we're telling. <laughs> and there was, that doesn't mean it, they're bad or wrong. You know, it was just, they don't agree with me, so they should be silenced or something like that. And I don't mean the extreme views, which I do think are not helpful and probably should be silenced, although that's also kind of dangerous territory. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't think, I mean, the thing, Mike, first to go back, I don't think any views should be yeah. silenced. I think that there is, is a real danger in silencing views. I think that what, where I go, if I'm having, you know, a conversation with somebody on a subject is to say, yeah. let's start by agreeing what is true, because once you agree what is true, then you can talk about what is right. And one of the problems that we do have today is that there's a growing problem with acknowledging what is true. Um, yes. And so there, when you have a debate over base reality, there's, there's a very big problem because then if, if you see the same events completely differently, then that, that next important question, what is right, becomes incredibly difficult to, to manage. Um, I think, so the, the way that I, I, I for, for me, and I don't know how you feel it, um, truth has a resonance. Um, when I hear something that is true, 
um, it, it resonates. And that's a starting point for me. It's not enough unto itself. I'm a scientific person. I want data. I want proof. But you know, when, when you see something and it's backed up by science and data and it's true, um, then you know, that's, that's a really important starting point for any discussion. And then we can talk about what's right. And you have to build it in that order. Because if you're having an argument with somebody, well, first of all, you've already lost because nobody's listening in an argument. They're just talking at each other. Um, but you often are talking about, you, know, you think this is right, I think that, that's right. But it's because you disagree on the base facts. And I think acknowledging what we know and what we don't know is incredibly important. My frame always is we live in a good and benevolent world um, that, you know, bad things happen, but that I trust that if I do my part, the universe will do its and that, you know, I have a responsibility every day to try to be the best person I can be to try to make the best difference that I can make to try to uh, help those that are around me. Uh, and to try to help them have a better world and to believe that if I do my part, the world will take care of it. And I think when you try to take on too much responsibility, where you take too much into your heart and you want to try to change too much and you're too hurt and you're too pained by the suffering that's out there, um, that you're missing that we are on a journey, you know, that this is that in our, in this discrete moment of time, there is pain. You know, I will have people say to me, and I'm sure you had the same thing. I, I'm having one of the best years of my life. You know, I don't want to admit it uh, because there's so many people who are suffering and, you know, I, I, I'm not suffering. You know, people are saying, you know, this hasn't been a hard year for me. My industry or my sector wasn't affected and my relationship is, happens to be in a really great place and they don't even want to admit that. But that's mm. not the lesson in a, in, a, in a time when we are in abundance. We shouldn't hide that abundance. That's a time when we need to share with people who aren't in abundance. And that ultimately is what makes a better society. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with being in a good place so long as we uh, we use that to try to affect change. But then the, the trick is to not then take so much into that into your heart that you are trying to become responsible for things that you can't reasonably be responsible for changing. And I think when people lose faith in institutions, lose faith that the people in institutions are good people doing good things, then there's a feeling of even greater responsibility because you're yeah. thinking, well, I can't just, I can't just leave it for, you know, the government to figure this thing out. I've got to figure it out. And how you draw those lines, I think is, you know, we don't have enough good discourse in, in, in political, in, in the political realm. You know, I'm, one of the reasons why I think that people are really having problems with that first piece, which is what is real is because, you know, having local media that really tells a local story that you can see and believe and participate in is gone, that everything has gone up seven different levels. And so they're talking about something that really isn't connecting to you because it's made for a much bigger media market and the conversations that are happening are making vast generalizations about people. So we're losing that local connection and dialogue on issues. Uh, and so, you know, how do we gain that back? I think people are trying to fill in that space through using new medium to uh, uh, new media to be able to have the conversations that are missing in uh, in in the so-called mainstream media, uh, they want to be able to tell that local story. They want to be able to talk about their individual experience and about how um, they're experiencing the 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 events. And of course, that is infinitely more real because it's actually grounded to a person instead of you know thousands of people aggregated into some big number. Yeah, yeah, that's. That's the wonderful description. Thank you. Um, so on that note, then how, okay, uh, to the note of doing our best to be at least in some sense on common ground about what is true. I definitely do agree with you. There is a felt sense to these higher order truths, you could say, or these, these things that are just seem to be true. Um, thing, so things such as when when politicians are caught in sticky situations and rather than be honest there's just such a facade put up and and i don't know if that honest discussions go on behind that facade or not but that's that is so like to me as a human and on my own path and seeing other people in their paths and like you said about the story on the ground floor when we're sincere and honest and open about the difficulties or our, for, you know, our shortcomings, then people seem to be way more understanding. Oh, and, for sure. Yeah. So how come that doesn't translate to the, I know it's sort of the magical question, but if we are to get 
If we're to progress as a civilization, that is a huge thing that must be addressed, in my opinion. And it's the well, same think, as an individual. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree, Mike. I mean, I think we all wear masks. Um, and we can go back to why we wear those masks. You know, for me, um, you know, I go back and none of it was intentional. But I learned at a very young age, there were parts of myself that that my parents at that time didn't accept or didn't like or felt I, I shouldn't express. And so in order to win the approval of my parents and to be the person that they thought I should be, I suppressed parts of myself. And I learned that there mm -hmm. were pieces mm -hmm. of myself that were not going to be accepted. And I took that out into the rest of my life. And so I believed that in order to be accepted, in order to be loved, in order to be have a place in the world, um, that I had to tell my story through a particular lens. And there were pieces right. of myself that wouldn't be accepted. And so I think we end up having... Um, we, the reason we don't have a lot of sympathy for one another when people make mistakes is because we, when it, when there doesn't, when the people still seem to be wearing a mask, we say, well, what else is there, right? Like I can get past right. this transgression, but what else is there? Because it seems right now, like you're not being yourself. It seems like the way you're answering these questions is you're, you're, you're sort of answering the questions like this, holding <laughs> something out in front of you. And um, the way that I would describe it, and, and, and we all do this to some degree. I mean, you know, we know somebody who's dealing with something really difficult, but they don't want to talk about it and they don't want to acknowledge it about themselves. And they like to believe that other people don't even see that thing. And so I, I equate it to, you know, kind of carrying around a bunch of oranges and you say to the person, hey, what's with the oranges? And they say back, I don't know what oranges, what oranges are you talking about? And you can see the oranges are there and yet they refuse to acknowledge their existence. And I, and I think it has a lot to do with that. And I think the truth is that when we are honest with each other, there is uh, so much more sympathy because uh, the world is not black and white. The, the, the reasons why we make mistakes, uh, we can all relate to. Uh, you know, we have all had similar traumas, um, some of us much worse than others, that mm -hmm. cause us to put that mask on. And so we can understand it. So when we see authenticity, when we see somebody own something, when we see somebody talk about why that mistake happened, where, where that frailty came from, then we trust it. And when somebody refuses to explain it to us, then we wonder what else is there. Um, but it's, it, it is, it is a, and it's an exacerbated problem in politics because we're so on display. But you know, right. I think there's very few people that I know that don't wear some form of mask. And that that mask that they wear is an inhibitor to connection and makes people make all kinds of crazy inferences about why that person may or may not be wearing that mask. Do you think, thank you, yeah, that's a wonderful, some part of me is like, when are you running for prime minister <laughs> in the back of my head? <laughs> but so, so with that frame, that's beautiful. Where or, or I think maybe you could speak to some of the, similar to somebody in their personal life, the short term consequences of honesty can obviously sometimes prevent someone from being honest. Perhaps, you know, if a politician is worried about being elected in the next election, then they're going to, you know, um, preference the short-term benefits of a decision over the long-term ones. And that I think relates to honesty as well and ethics and morals and all those kind of things. Is there much discussion about in government, perhaps? So that one piece, is there much discussion in government about how to, I think, be more, run our societies in more conducive ways for long term? And, and maybe how the difficulty about being honest and open in the present con conflicts with that? Yeah, and I, and I think that part of that is that we have to have more honesty flowing in both directions. Um, so it, you know, when we talk about um, a, a situation where, because the, the media cycles tend to be very negative, very focused on negative things, very focused on, yeah. you know, sort yeah. of gotcha type uh, uh, stories, um, then, you know, when uh, what generally grabs the headlines are, are things that are negative. So it means that from a perspective of somebody who's holding public office, you're thinking I am one misplaced phrase away from oblivion. You know, I'm, right. I, if I say, if I just make one mistake and how I word yeah. something, uh, 
you know, I, it could be misconstrued. Or if I have a crazy idea and I just want to float it out there, maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's not even a great idea, but I just want to have a discussion about it. I want to hear what other people have to think about it. You can't put that on the table because as soon as you put it on the table, you know, so-and-so an X party wants to do this insane thing and, and wants yeah. to destroy the country as opposed to somebody's exploring an idea. Uh, and, right. you know, if you have a healthy environment, if you think of a healthy workplace, a healthy workplace fosters errors. It fosters mistakes because those aren't mistakes, right? And on, if somebody right. through honest experimentation makes an error, they are learning and our system is learning. And so we have to have room for people to make mistakes, room for people to make error. We have to celebrate it in some ways when it's done honestly, as opposed to being caught in this kind of gotcha. And we all play it. You know, we're, we're, I'm not just saying that it's the journalists doing it. You know, we're looking to gain advantage. So if somebody says something that, you know, so I think we get caught in this generally. Um, and, yeah. uh, and that's problematic. And, and, and how do you then sort that out from when somebody says something that's really unacceptable? Because, you know, there's some form of experimentation that isn't okay. There's right. some issues, Absolutely. there's some issues yeah. that, you know, yeah. we, we know that being a racist is not okay. You don't, shouldn't be experimenting yeah. with that, you know? <laughs> right. So it's, um, there are certain, you know, so it's a complex minefield, but I think, first of all, we have to look at what what the honest intent behind that idea is and that if somebody is saying something that's a little outside of the boundaries of what i heard before instead of yelling them down and tweeting what a horrible human being they are giving them right. a little space to be able to have that dialogue um, and then i think from the perspective of um, those are in the political field we have to have more trust and faith that people will see what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish and hope that they will have an appreciation that you know we're looking into the void and just trying to figure this out you know one of the things you realize is a, as a parent you know and i'm sure you can relate to this is that when i was a kid i thought my parents had answers like i thought you know I, there was something they learned they that they knew what was going on and when i got old i would understand what's going on you realize they're just looking into the void trying to make things up like we're all just looking into the darkness trying to create light and you know and, and it's and, and it isn't so easy to know what that answer is and so for anybody, I don't care who you are, what job you're doing, where you are in the world, if you're a person trying to look into that unknown and create something positive and taking chances to do it, that's brave and it needs to be celebrated. And we know the people that are doing that. There are the people that are actively taking jumps and going into that darkness and trying to create things and trying to make the world a better place. And they aren't 100% sure about the answer. They may not even be 50% sure of the answer, but they're doing their best to find out. And then we know the other people who sit on the sidelines and who make fun of those people, who criticize those people, who dump on those people, who armchair quarterbacks say, I could have done better, I would have done better, I would have, well, you know, then get in there and do it. And that doesn't mean, you know, do my job. It means, it doesn't even mean do your job. It just means whatever you think you can do to make a positive difference, get involved. And the more you get involved, the more you see it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing um, to do. And we should have mutual respect for each other. And we should have mutual respect for people who are doing it, even with different opinions, even who are trying to do it. And, you know, I have in my career been too partisan because I saw the world in too black or white away at different moments in time. You know, but the more you know, you see that, you know, even if somebody completely disagrees with you, there's probably a piece of their perspective that needs to be understood. There's probably a piece of their story that you're not understanding and you haven't connected to, but it's true. If somebody's that passionate about something and they're a good person, there's a piece of them that you can learn from. And, and that's where we should be going from. And I, I think we have so much conflict and it's so unfortunate because the people that are on the front lines of trying to make the world a better place are doing it earnestly. And, you know, just because we have this slight difference, when we start vilifying each other, that's when you open the doorways for extremity. And when you uh, open the doorways for people to reject uh, the system overall, and perhaps, you know, reject the principles of enlightenment overall. Um, and, and that's very dangerous. So we have to realize the real life consequences of our dialogue and how that shuts down the thing that makes our system as, as beautiful as it can be and as beautiful as it should be. Yeah, that's awesome. The I appreciate your acknowledgement too of your partisanship or your your awareness of, of perhaps or did I is that the wrong way bipartisanship? What's the way to or say or partisanship? That? Yeah, when you're right. too partisan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. you know, that's that's look. I think that it's uh, 
it's great in one sense. You know, you're passionate about what you believe. You're passionate that that you and the people that you're with have the right vision for the country. That that passion is good, um, but it needs you need to restrain yourself a little bit. You need to sort of uh, uh, take a take a step back and ask, um, you know, is there are there pieces of, the, of this puzzle that I'm not seeing? Uh, you know, am I afraid to acknowledge the truth another person is speaking because I'm afraid that that truth will undermine uh, my position. Right. Yeah. Where yeah. I think anytime you acknowledge truth um, is, is is seen as a positive thing, uh, you know, including when you make a mistake. Uh, but, you know, we have a bit of, you know, you talk about a, a macho culture that exists, uh, you know, in our military or in the RCMP and, and trying to make cultural changes. That culture exists in politics, you know, that these are, you're, you know, admitting you're wrong is weakness, that you're supposed to be tough as nails, you're supposed to be, have you know thick skin. It's a blood sport. Uh, you go in there, you get you get stabbed, punched, and thrown into ditches, and you <laughs> say thank you for the experience. You know, it's um, it's so it's culturally uh, we need a bit of a renaissance too in acknowledging um, in acknowledging we're wrong, acknowledging that we have weakness, acknowledging that we aren't as strong and as we uh, as we sometimes say we are, acknowledging that we don't have all those answers. But that's not a source of weakness. That's a source of strength yeah. and. Absolutely. And to trust that yeah. people would perceive it that way. Yeah, that relates really nicely to your metaphor, perhaps of the dark and the light when we're exploring these ideas and difficult situations. We really kind of are metaphorically in the dark. And we've, that's become such a unpromoted practice, or I, I don't know if that's the right word, but one aspect I would say from research on youth mental health problems is that young people from the numbers are very or flexible but around the mid 90s were way overprotected way kind of coddled and not allowed you know we got to protect you from this and you're not i remember when they tore out the playgrounds in the schools i mean that's insane because of fear of injury and stuff and so that I think contributes a little bit to this lack of exploration into difficult topics. It's a bit outside the context of this, but that does exist. And perhaps COVID in some ways, I've heard one of the famous researchers on this topic say, maybe COVID's going to help kind of toughen up some of the kids that have been called so badly. Uh, who knows? And that's a generalization, of course. Um, well, I think what it does, yeah. I think the, the biggest problem, Mike, I, 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 and I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, but I, I think one of the biggest problems is that when we um, overprotect, uh, our underlying message is you can't trust yourself. So yeah. I'll just give you a very simple example. Uh, when I was a kid, um, you know, I, 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 the only thing I was allowed to eat was healthy food. Uh, you know, I wasn't allowed to have any candy, you know, every once in a blue moon, I get some kind of candy, I wasn't allowed, uh, you know, white bread, and, 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 and I thought this was the right idea, I raised my kids that way, I was an extremely strict parent, when it came to, uh, to food. And I, I realize now that what I was teaching my kids is they can't trust themselves on food. And, um, you know, Steph, uh, who's my partner, has a beautiful daughter, Allie, she takes a completely different approach, which is to trust her and to trust that she knows what she's doing, give her the information, and then ask her to make the decision for herself, and to give herself autonomy and control over that. And I think at a, at a young age, we're told, um, you can't trust yourself, you're going to make bad decisions, you're going to be a bad kid, you're going to go out and do bad things. You know, don't go and drink alcohol, don't go and uh, and, and do drugs, don't go and eat lots of sugary things. And yes, of course, these things are true, uh, but you have to be the one that's in control of that. And as a parent, you have to know when you can start trusting your kids to make those decisions themselves. And so when we have too many rules, effectively we're broadcasting to people that they can't be trusted. And it, there's nothing worse than telling somebody they can't be trusted. And then even worse than that, what we do is, you know, when, when the kids go to sleep, uh, we pull out the snacks and we have the snacks, but the kids didn't. And we expect them to be able to be better than we ever were. We expect them not to make the mistakes that they ever made. And we hold out a version of ourselves, this, this puritanical person who did no wrong. And they think, I can't live up to that. I can't be like my parents were. I can't possibly meet those standards. And then, of course, what happens is you find out later on that your parents are real people and they were hiding all of these things from you. And they had all these frailties that they didn't tell you about. And that's when you end up having an enormous amount of conflict with your parents, because my life would have been a lot easier if you told me that you were struggling, if you told me that you were struggling 
with issues around your sexuality, if you told me that you were struggling with issues around food, if you told me you were struggling with, uh, you know, feeling that the, the world sometimes can be a really dark place and you don't know that how, how you, if you have enough strength and light inside of you to push it back sometimes. Uh, you know, when we share our common struggle, I think we do a lot better. And I think inadvertently when we have too many rules um, that, that all we do is push people towards those things and then make them feel terrible when they do make errors that make them harder than come back from. Yeah, uh, excellent. When I do stuff with like student parent councils of schools and, and et cetera, one of the big things is <laughs> practice what you preach. And I think a huge part of that controlling nature is actually the parents insecurity, right? It has nothing to right. do with the kid. And that is something that I think people have a hard time swallowing is that you're projecting your insecurities onto your kids or even onto your partner or onto society, onto et cetera. And, and, you know, the name of sort of all the work is starts with me. It's like, you've got to turn inward and see why you are acting in these ways. And then hopefully you can take responsibility for that. But that idea, and I'm also, this is out of my own maintenance of sanity and well-being is I don't lie. And I used to lie a lot as a drug addict, like lying was goes with the territory. And, and so that created so much suffering for me that I get nauseous when I even consider a lie. Um, and that's not to be, I, I don't judge other people that lie, so to speak. So, but it is very helpful and goes back to our discussion around politics. How can we individually move towards being more honest and open? And then by doing that, we perhaps allow others to do the same. And back, uh, the thing around rules too, I think is great because that is a perfect, what did it say? Transition into a question I wanted to ask you. Um, are you familiar with B, I think it's Bill C-16. Do you know that one? Uh, well, I don't know them by their bill numbers uh, okay, just because sure. they That's... change they change every session of parliament. So it's um, oh, got what, it. is, okay, what so... is Bill C-16 <laughs> yeah. one parliament is is Bill, you know, it, me it means something totally different from parliament to parliament. Wonderful, but, wonderful. But if you explain okay. the, the legislation, I'll know yeah. the legislation. Sure, of course, yeah. So it's, it's around... Uh, as far and I'm going to do my best to understand, uh, to describe it as I understand. It's about uh, the use of pronouns in language in society, right? And so I think as I understand it, this is the first time a Western government has ever made it, has ever compelled speech from their citizens. So if, so we are told if we don't say certain words, then we can be tried by the human rights tribunal or something along those lines. And so that to me seems pretty crazy for the first time ever, we're compelling words out of people's mouths. And so like, this is my interpretation of that. And I know on the extremes, again, it can sound ridiculous. And in some ways it is, but there was an example in BC where this played out in real time recently. I think it was a year or so ago where a person who was trans transgender or, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna get all the labels correct, but it was a man who was living as a woman and without surgery. And this man was going into kind of female nail salons and wax parlors and those kind of things and asking for them to wax his penis, basically his balls and stuff. And then some of the women refused to and he took them to the human rights tribunal because he claimed they were violating his human rights. And so their whole lives were destroyed from the legal bills and all this. I wouldn't say their, their businesses were destroyed because they were forced to shut down and all these things. And like, to me, that is, is a really good example of a lot of what we're talking about. And I'm not trying to like, I don't, I mean, I do think we shouldn't be telling each other what should be saying but at the same time of course we have to respect people's rights to dignity and good life and respect and we have to treat each other fairly and all that kind of stuff so i'm just kind of curious 
because yeah, that so I, bill yeah it's like that that's well, not let's, real let's take, <laughs> like, well i that? think we, i think we take two we take two steps back and then we can connect it to some yeah. of the things that we were talking sure, about earlier sure. i'm not aware of the case that you mentioned but i have okay. to say that it, that in 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 the cases that i do know in a canadian context there's obviously there there's always a lot more color and a lot more information um, than what we would superficially see when a story comes to us. So I, I don't know, I, I, but I do know that, that the vast majority of cases that go before the Human Rights Tribunal that, that, that would end up being in a place where they were litigated for a length of time and not just tossed out, generally have some form of merit. In terms right. of legislation um, that, um, that opens the ability uh, for uh, people in, uh, in government forms to be able to identify how they identify, uh, and to be able to give them the opportunity um, when they're, you know, whether or not it's a census form, whether or not it's a, a driver's license or whatever the case might be for somebody to be able to identify the way that they want to identify. I think it goes back to our conversation about the ability to be honest. You know, it's wonderful that we say that people can be whoever they want to be and we want everybody to express their individuality and be different, but just don't be too different. You know, like it's, it's uh, you know, what we say is you're allowed to be different between this goalpost and this goalpost. And here right. I'm not talking about people that hurt people. Obviously, anybody right. that, um, that, that uses, uh, you know, as an excuse, this is who I am um, to yeah. per perpetrate violence uh, in, any, in any form or uh, to subjugate another person is utterly unacceptable. But I do think that, they're, that, that our goalposts are too tight. I mean, you know, to use an extreme example, one day I wore a yellow blazer and it was national news. You know, I mean, uh, so what? A man wore color. You, you know, get over yeah. it. It's, um, I, I like things that are colorful and every once in a while that should be allowed. I mean, we have very tight ideas of how people are able to express themselves. And yeah. we know, you, you would know in your story, you're talking about coming out and having struggles with, um, with, uh, with with addiction to uh, to drugs, that you know that that coming out of a closet to say that hey I have this problem this is something that I struggled with, that is an enormously difficult thing to do, and I think that we have an obligation not by compelling speech not by litigating there's never going to be anybody litigated if 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 you want us to refuse to acknowledge somebody the way that they're asking to be uh, you know to be acknowledged. I mean, you can tell them to get lost and say, I'm not going to do that. But I think that we, in our own journey, when we think of how difficult it was for us to accept ourselves and whatever odd iteration that I am or somebody else is, um, that, you know, to say, sure, you know, if you're going to be in my life and you want to be referred to um, by a different pronoun, then absolutely, you know, for me, I'm going to do that. Are you going to be litigated against if you refuse to do that? No. Are you going to be litigated against if you don't want that person in your life? No. Are you going to be litigated against if you think that person's ridiculous? No. But I think the, the goal of government at the end of the day is to hold open as wide as possible um, the opportunity for self-expression and the opportunity for people to be who they want to be with who they want to be. Uh, and leave it up to a uh, higher power at the end of our lives to sort out yeah. who did what was right and who did what was wrong. The exception to that, obviously, is when we hurt other people or when we incite other people to hurt people or when we subjugate right. people. But outside right. of those things, I think we want to leave those doorways as wide as open. And I think right as wide open as possible. And I think, you know, I inadvertently, I look at, you know, for my own children, the, the boundaries that I placed on them through my, through my, um, uh, my expectations that were totally inadvertent, um, you know, that because at the end of the day, my kids look at the way that I model myself, you know, they look at the way that, that I, I do things and, um, and think, okay, well, that's how the standard I should hold myself to. But then I would have, a, you know, secret elements of myself that I'm not sharing uh, with them about uh, things that I struggled with or how I coped or what my failures were. And um, I, I, so I think that, you know, we can do that societally as well, um, that I think we're a much healthier place if we want to deal with mental health, if we want to deal with people getting to a place of feeling at peace, what's more peaceful than being accepted? What gives you more joy than somebody saying, I see you, and I accept you, and I celebrate you? There's nothing better in the world than that. And some of us get that easily. And some of us get it very hard. Some of us are, have things that are inside of us that are very hard to reconcile. And we have a very difficult journey to be able to tell our story. And I think, uh, you know, if we have it easy, if we can tell our story and we can, you know, do the truth that you're talking about in a way that's easy for us, we're lucky. And, you know, part of telling truth when we talk, because I agree with you, I think we should always speak truth. 
Uh, the problem is that you, <laughs> you realize that the people that we lie to the most is ourselves. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of times we think we're telling truth, but really later on, we learned that there were aspects of ourselves that we were closed off to and we were not being honest with ourselves about. So this whole business of truth is, is very difficult. And I think that if we are to live in a more truthful world, that we need to have doors that are more open. But to be very clear, nobody's going to be litigated for uh, for not using uh, a pronoun they don't want to use. Right. Yeah. So what's so why why? And I totally agree with you. Like, and I don't think anyone who took well, I shouldn't say that. I think most good people totally agree with everybody's right to be called whatever they want, when they want, how they want in, in the, in the essence of, like you said, nothing is better than being who you are and being accepted for that. Um, so if no one's going to be like, I don't understand this enough and I don't really care. Well, I shouldn't say I, I, the legislation part, I don't care about enough, but if it is law, then why, why make it into law if no one's going to be litigated for it? And is that true that no one would be litigated for that? 100% nobody's going to be litigated. And when we talk about going into law, it's it, it we're simply creating conditions where somebody cannot be discriminated against uh, yeah, for, yeah. For, for how they are being asked to. So when people talk about, oh, this is terrible, somebody could be litigated. Well, you, you right. have litigation against them. Yes, you can. If you, if you say, well, I'm not going to hire you. Uh, because right. I don't like the fact that you use that pronoun instead of this pronoun. Yeah, yeah, or if yeah. you say, um, you know what, um, uh, I'm going to exclude you from this opportunity, or you're not allowed to walk into my restaurant because you use this pronoun. I mean, that's, that's crossing a different line, right? It's very different. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that, and that's the line that, that is here. It, it is simply saying you cannot discriminate against somebody for that. It is not saying, right, right, it's not right, saying right. that if you encounter somebody, if you encounter somebody, uh, you know, after this, after this podcast is over yeah. and they say, uh, Hey, you know, use this pronoun and you say, forget it. I'm never using that pronoun. I'm going to use the pronoun I want. I mean, you can do that and there's not going to be any consequence. Uh, should you do that? That's another matter. Uh, but sure, you're not yeah. going to be, you're not, but you're, there's no litigation that that person can bring against you. If you tell that person, you never want to talk to them again, because one of the things we're so lucky to have in this country is the charter yeah. of rights and freedoms. And that document, when it was authored, maybe didn't contemplate all the ways that it eventually would be used, but it is a light that basically says you be you and, and, and I be me, and that this document is going to protect it. And it is as ardent in its protection of somebody who is an example um, has the belief that they totally disagree with people who are using different, you, you can have the view that these, uh, that people who are using different pronouns are wrong. You can believe that uh, the choices they make are wrong. You can say that, you can write about it, you can talk about it, and you will have right. nothing happen to you because that charter protects you and protects free speech. And it must, because the idea of free speech is that it protects the things that we most don't want to hear, right? If, if right. free speech right. just protected us to say the things we wanted to hear, there's no, there's nothing free about it. It, the, yeah. you, we, and, and in fact, in Canada, there has never been a successful um, case brought against somebody uh, for, for, for using speech. And some said, you know, for example, when people have used very hateful speech, speech that has incited violence and, and speech that has incited hate, you know, even those people aren't being litigated. So, you know, there's some argument that maybe we have to be firmer on, 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 on protecting that speech. But in Canada, we've always taken the side of really protecting speech. And that's why you really can't find an example of somebody who, uh, you know, was exercising free speech yeah. and face litigation. Yeah. It's always a fear that's put out there, but it's a fear. It's a fear that kind of comes from this idea of, yes, if you, uh, if you uh, make a decision to reject somebody for a job, because uh, just in the same way, if you say, well, I don't hire somebody who's black, I'm sorry, you have to leave right, right now. Nobody right. would say, oh, well, that's a reasonable policy. You know, that's okay. Right. It's the right. same thing with pronouns. If somebody says, hey, just so you know, I use a different pronoun. This is the pronoun I use. And you say, well, you can't work here. Uh, you know, people who do that aren't allowed to work here. That's the only time that you would encounter a problem. Uh, that, and that's right. what this legislation is about. Great. That's super helpful. Thank you for helping me understand that better. And that, to me, that seems right. That's the right thing to do, 100%. Um, awesome. Okay. I know we're getting kind of towards the end and I, gosh, I could pick your brain forever. This has been so fun. Um, I guess uh, we didn't get too much into the COVID stuff, but maybe just um, wh where, I guess, yeah, on the surface kind of how, 
how are we do you think we've done as a country with COVID in relationship to the world? And like, how do you see, you know, <laughs> I don't want to give anybody any false hope. I don't want to have any false hope, but where do you see us and how we've done and where we're going? And, and yeah, maybe one thing I would love to hear you say, sorry, is just how do we know what we're doing is the right thing to do? And even if we don't know, Perhaps I think it would be nicer if our talking heads were a little more forthright about kind of how difficult it is to know what to do and that they're doing their best and that kind of thing. Sure. There's a lot there. Uh, let me just say on the yeah. first on the first point, this is uh, an incredibly hard thing. I don't think it, when you live through something that's very difficult, um, you don't fully have an appreciation of just how hard it is. I think if you yeah. want to give yourself a, a perception of just how hard what we're going through is, imagine yourself uh, before this began and somebody said, hey, by the way, for the next year, you're not going to be able to, to see the closest people that you love the most. The, the people that you love the most that are older and more vulnerable are going to be at a very high risk of dying and you're probably going to lose somebody that's in your life. Um, you're not going to be able to go to a restaurant. You're not going to be able to have a vacation. If you love music and concerts like I do, you're not going to be able to do any of that. You're not going to be able to, 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 to see or spend time with your friends. Um, you're going to have to rely on basically just the one other person, or maybe if, you know, you're, if you've got kids that the kids that you have in their house, or maybe if you're, if you're single, nobody, um, you're going to have to do all of your work through, through, uh, a, a webcam. Uh, and you're you're going to be told conflicting information where you're not really sure when it's ending and you're not really sure what's going on. And there's a risk of mutations and uh, and people who are young are dying and our hospitals are overloaded. And, you know, it, it's madness. It is madness. And so, first of all, we have to have an enormous amount of sympathy for each other. And I'm actually very hopeful, very hopeful that, that we're going to have a lot more sympathy for one another generally, because this idea that there are people out there coasting around with easy lives and nothing that's hard, it's a lie. They're, those people don't exist. Yeah. I, I can tell you, you've met a lot of people. I've met a lot of people. You peel the veneer of any person, and there is something down there that was incredibly hard for them to go through. And this is now something that we've all gone through together, a point of common um, trauma that we're going to be able to talk about and share and have sympathy and empathy for one another for. Um, so that's the first point. We're doing really well. Given how hard this is, I, I'm tremendously proud of Canadians and how generous we've been to each other, how kind we've been to our neighbors, how much we were willing to sacrifice to do our best to try to uh, make sure as few people are hurt as possible. The, the sacrifice that people are willing to make, it's remarkable. Uh, how are we doing? We're doing pretty well. Uh, you know, we could do better. The community spread is too high. The numbers are too high. We're losing too many lives. Uh, we could have better adherence. So, you know, we try to, in this country, compel one another to make those sacrifices and to, to, to give up things without legislating it. You know, at the end of the day, um, you, this isn't martial law, you know, that when people are asked to make these restrictions, most of it is, you know, pretty please would you. And people have been really excellent in it. What we know about measures, because I know that people are very concerned we're in a lockdown right now and and it's and it's very hard and we're asking is the cost of that lockdown higher than the benefit that we're gaining i think yeah. the numbers bear out and you can see the numbers now uh, stabilizing in ontario you can take a look at what they are in other jurisdictions that have had less controls and see that this is 100 percent the right thing to do that our hospitals and our hospital workers are at the very brink um, where right now elective surgeries and elective procedures are out the window that pretty soon we're going to be in a situation where hospitals can't take somebody who has an emergency event like a cardiac arrest or stroke uh, or you know somebody who uh, has an accident uh, if you don't have room in a hospital for you to go uh, we got a big problem and then the other problem is mutations the more of this virus that's out there the more opportunity it has to mutate it becomes something even more deadly it's something that we don't have a vaccine for so um, you know we do know that um, that look frankly if we all just stayed at home for two weeks and didn't see anybody this thing would be done uh, I mean, that's not a realistic, people won't do that, but we should try to be as close to that as possible. Get those numbers down low, recognize that this deep sacrifice that we've made is just a little bit further away. And, th and that will lead me to your other question, which is when are we out of this thing? And nobody knows for sure, but what we do know 
is that the vaccines um, are are uh, are accelerating in their in their availability. They'll really start to be uh, coming in once production uh, is ramped up much heavier in, in uh, the month of April. The Canada has an enormous supply uh, that everybody who wants it will be vaccinated by the time uh, we reach September. Um, and that that seems like a long time, but in, in the course of our lives, um, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's something we can all do for one another to keep one another safe. Um, and we'll deal with the restrictions um, based on where the numbers are at the time. Um, the science that we have on masks is very solid. The science that we have on physical distancing is very solid. Now, there's some evidence that we uh, that, is, that, that uh, six meters isn't enough. Um, that really we should be have it, should have more. And so there is some emergence to that. But we also have to be realistic. Um, you know, if you're in an urban environment and you've got to go get groceries uh, and you're wearing a mask, uh, you know, some six meters is probably about as realistic as it gets. So we're doing as good as we can with this. Um, this is totally new. This is something we've never dealt with before. The last time there was a pandemic, it was the Spanish flu. And we didn't know a lot more. Um, uh, we don't know a lot more now than we did then. Uh, so I think, yeah, we got to be honest about it. But I, I think the measures that we do have compared to places that don't have those measures demonstrate that we're doing the right thing. We got to stay the path. We're going to get through this. We'll do it together. And I, and I honestly believe we're moving to a, a much more connected, much more honest, uh, much more gracious and much more uh, understanding world on the other side. Okay. Thank you so much for holding my hand through some of the darkness. Um, your clarity was very comforting and um, best of luck in your work. I know you got to go. So thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. I'm happy to do it anytime. And, uh, and thanks okay. for what you're doing. Really appreciate it. Okay, buddy. Take care. Take care. <laughs> Bye.